Good evening, I'm calling this February 20th, 2020, 220, 2020, there's a lot of twos in there. Sammamish Planning Commission meeting to order. Um, let's start out the evening with roll call, starting on my left. Uh, Larry Crandall. Ritu Jain Dabre. Mark Boffman. Mike Presco. Mark Lewis. Karthik Sitaraman. I believe we have Josh on the phone again this evening. Josh, can you hear us? I can. Great. So we've got everybody here. Let's uh, start out with approval of the agenda for this evening. Anybody have any comments about the agenda this evening, which is pretty simple? Okay, we'll call the agenda approved by common consent. Uh, any comments on the meeting minutes from the last meeting, the February 6th meeting? Uh, I have only one comment, but I think you experienced, I was able to watch the meeting from afar, and as and Josh was on the phone, uh, so his his responses came in late. So I thought that he was saying nay, and he might have wanted to nominate me and and me he for the but congratulations for <laughs> you too. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll suggest that you keep track of that for next year. <laughs> And try again. <laughs> okay, I don't think we need to change the minutes for that. <laughs> Anything else on the minutes? Okay, we'll call the uh, minutes from the February 6th meeting approved by common consent. Uh, next is public comment on non-agenda items. This evening we're going to be talking about um, the phase two of development regulation updates. So for those who may have something to comment on not related to that, now's the time. Small crowd tonight. Hi, my name's Mary Wichter and I live at 408 208th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish. I'm just really excited that the Urban Forestry Management Plan is gonna be coming up, I believe, March 5th in front of you. Um, and so I've been trying to notify people. And there is a really nice thing. My husband actually sent me for Valentine's Day where there was a couple, um, one guy is a photographer, and uh, where they live, which is in a foreign country, um, everything had just been scarped and scraped away. And then they started a project in 1994 to reforest and put stuffs back in. Um, it's a wonderful article, and I didn't have time to send it out before this meeting, but I will send that out and anything that you have for urban forestry management plan, um, public comment from Jan Bird and the stormwater stewards and a lot of people had said, please fast track the urban forestry management plan implementation strategies. We need them, we need them done. We need whatever they can be done to happen in first quarter. It's not even coming to you guys until um, March. So I would like people to look ahead, read ahead, think about that because it's a great big topic. I've been speaking in front of council and planning commission for almost five years now. And I know when I first started, they were booting almost everything into urban forestry management plan because we were gonna get to it one day. That was 2015, so now that it's 2020, we really need everybody to be involved and do your best. So um, I will send you the one link. I won't talk a lot about it because the link itself presents and it talks about how to new, use native species. Um, also, I wanted to thank the city um, and Washington Native Plant Society. I was able to take a master native plant steward course that was given at Sammamish Plateau Water. There's about 700 of those stewards across uh, the state. There were 20 of us that involved and we're actually doing restoration projects in the city. They train us for 100 hours and then we have to work somewhere in the city for 100 hours, so we're doing um, restoration at Evans Creek Preserve, there's two teams, and also East Sammamish Park, which is by Mead. So if you see that going on, it's happening through those volunteers, and any volunteer anywhere, we even have people coming from Preston and Seattle that wants to help their sign up date. So just wanted to let you know those great things are going on, but we're really looking forward to the Urban Forestry Management Plan getting kicked off, you guys doing your very best work, and it going to council with stuff we know can get passed, thanks. Thanks for your comments, Mary. Paul, any non-agenda comments? All right. With the chair's permission, I just wanted to mention that uh, I was absent uh, leaving this area on February 2nd, returning on the 15th, and you had a lot of rain at that time. So, you know, there's- I hadn't noticed. Oh, okay. Well, we heard about it, <laughs> and we were in an area that was pretty, uh, Era. It did rain down there the first day we were there, but the irony, irony really is of the deciduous and uh, 
con- conferred trees, uh, and Mary is right in bringing that. We've been talking for this since, I think, uh, 2014, really. Uh, and I remembered uh, the inventor of the bumper shoot was in a rainy period, and uh, he saw this kind of deciduous tree and the water is rolling off. So that's how the umbrella was invented. Okay, that's enough. Thanks, Larry. Okay, let's move to our uh, new business for this evening, which we'll start out with a presentation on our next efforts and development regulation updates. Good evening, David Pyle, Community Development. So we are uh, back now uh, to talk about uh, phase two of our development regulations update. Um, What we're gonna do tonight is we're going to review the phase one changes that were made and ultimately adopted under ordinance 2019-482. Talk a little bit about the process that was used um, for that code change effort. We're going to walk through some um, potential uh, options for you to asked to be included in phase two. We're going to talk about uh, the phase two proposed process and what constraints we see um, in, in attempting to make some additional changes. And then we're going to ask that the, the commission um, have a discussion and provide a recommendation to staff on any things that they think are, are um, valuable to include in phase two. Uh, development regulations update phase one was the result of years and years of staff hearing from the community and from builders um, and from council members about products that we were seeing built here in the community. Um, we, We had attended many hearings, talked to many people over the years, and just going out in the community whether driving around um, for the purpose of business or even at lunch or going on a lunch run, you do notice a lot of things here in the community that could have been done differently and could have ultimately resulted in a better outcome. Um, One of the questions that uh, a friend of mine, I was having a conversation about some stuff in Seattle. She works as a planner in Seattle and they've been tasked recently with trying to rethink development from a sense of if you could have done it differently back when it was built, how would you have done it regardless of zoning um, to get a different outcome today to help us fix some of the problems that we are seeing today. So as we go through this, I think that's a really good way of thinking about it is zoning aside, development regulations aside, what is the outcome that you all would want to see here in your city And what do you think would be um, some alternative ways to address the issues that we face today in an effort to not repeat those problems tomorrow? Um, So going back to the conversation about phase one, um, it was organized into eight topics and these topics were the result of um, conversations where we distilled down the, the concerns that we heard into Um, problems that were right in front of us that were tangible that where we could actually make a code change to address them. They included things like density rounding, setbacks, fences, building height. Um, In in many instances, there may not have actually been a real problem. There was a perception of a problem. And just in visiting that topic and making some minor adjustments to that topic might have addressed that issue in itself. Um, The primary focus with the commission, if you recall, um, and I don't remember how many of you were actually on the commission during these discussions. So three of you, four four of you, yep. Um, uh, The primary focus with the commission was on the operative language, the concept and the outcome, um, as opposed to trying to add new tools to the code or trying to restructure the code. We really wanted to focus on turning the knobs and, and moving the levers in a way that ultimately got us a different outcome. If you think about it, a subdivision process as an assembly line to build houses, what things can you change to get a different product? Um, the secondary focus um, was on, I guess, the dimensional setting. So it was 
that's part of it, the, and which could be adjusted over time. So if we found that we got that one wrong, you know, say we said a, a 35 foot building height should be changed to 40 feet or to 30 feet, it's easy to change that at a later date, if that makes sense. It's much easier than going in and adding a whole new concept to the code. So we, we really wanted to set it up so that we could fine tune it over time um, with some simple adjustments. Um, the ancillary associated changes were also made um, that did not change the outcome, such as changing the word street setback to front yard setback. Um, these were things in the code that needed to be changed throughout multiple sections in order to bring consistency, but they didn't actually change the outcome. It just was more um, related to the end user and the ability to use the code. Um, the first topic that was changed uh, was density rounding. This had been a long-standing problematic issue here in the community where if you had um, just a little bit over 0.5, you were able to um, round up. So the question is, 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 it's kind of like going to the store and, and wanting to buy a gallon of milk and the, the milk costs $3, but you only have $2.51 should you be able to buy the gallon of milk? Um, it's a little bit fundamental stating it that way, but that is the question that we've been asked by many citizens in the community is that, you know, they don't have enough land for three lots. How come they're allowed to get three lots? Um, and it's something where on a small project, it means a lot to a builder, it makes the, the project financially feasible, but also on a small project, it provides a lot, it creates a lot of impact to the community where the lot isn't big enough to have three lots, but yet they're able to accomplish it. Um, so we, we did a lot of work. That was actually one of the um, most detailed discussions that was held with the council was related to density rounding. Um, and um, what the result was is that um, they set density rounding for subdivisions and short subdivisions differently. The idea there was that in a subdivision, which is greater than 10 units, if you were able to round up at 0.51, then you would not notice as much because the project is a bigger project. Um, whereas for short subdivisions of less than nine units, you were only allowed to round up at 0.71. The idea there being that it gets you closer to having the right amount of land to get the three lots. So you would not notice it as much in the community and the impact would be less on the community. One of the things that was also done, which I think has been overlooked a lot by the development community and by um, advocates for housing affordability was that they also added, and this conversation started with the commission and it continued into the council, Council ultimately added a, a um, requirement that the extra unit achieved through rounding must be built in the form of an affordable duplex. Um, so they gave some incentive because that extra unit ultimately would create two units. So if you had, um, for example, 11.65 um, was your density calculation result, um, you were able to build either 11 single family homes or you could build 11 single family homes and a duplex for a total of 13 units. So the idea there was that we would start to see where there was this a little bit of extra land on these properties, builders start to build affordable um, duplexes. So there, there are also other incentives um, in the code for, for building duplexes for affordability. So if a builder wanted to build by choice, so say a builder had 11.65 um, was their density calculation. Per the code today, they could build 11 single family homes and, and one duplex for a total of 13 units. There are also other ex that were pre-existing bonuses in the code that directs that a, a duplex, an affordable duplex is only counted as one unit. So they could in theory build 10 single family homes, one affordable duplex by choice and get two units out of that, and another affordable duplex from the density bonus. 
So what we're trying to do there is we're trying to promote and incentivize some diversity in housing choices here in the city by seeing some duplexes be built within a subdivision that follows design guidelines for duplexes. Duplexes are supposed to look like a single family home. They're not supposed to have two entrances on the same, same side of the building. Um, so there are things that they're required to do to integrate that into the design of the neighborhood. Um, so this was a, a, an effort that I think is overlooked a lot in the community um, that was put into effect. We haven't yet seen it play out, although we have had recently, we've had a little bit of a resurgence in, in inquiries regarding subdivisions, and we have had several applicants ask about how they could build half of their project in duplexes and half of their project in single family homes. So there is some attention being brought to this and we might actually see some products come out of this in maybe three to four years, which is when they actually might be built. Is there any question on the density rounding? Okay. <laughs> um, the other, the next one, which, which was, wait. So the duplex, uh, that is not available for short subdivision. Is that available only for the subdivisions? It's available for both a subdivision and a short subdivision. Thank you. So you, you, if you had one lot and you wanted to turn it into two um, and you wanted to create just voluntarily one of those into a duplex, you could actually get three units out of it. The next one is related to setbacks. Um, this was a big one. This is really, I think, the driver of a lot of the uh, complaints around product that we see on the ground. The Highcroft project is one that we hear about a lot just down the road here. Um, and I, I credit the commission. Um, Mark worked a lot on this and had some good ideas. They all had good, you all had good ideas. Um, but ultimately we came up with a system of dynamic setbacks that basically says that if you wanna have a big house, you have to have a big lot. If you wanna have a small house, you can have a small lot. And there are um, bracketed settings in between. So for homes less than 2,500 square feet in floor area, you don't need a big lot. For homes that are over 4,000 square feet in area, you, you have much larger setbacks and therefore you need to have a bigger lot. Um, and what we, what, one of the problems we were having in this community that became more pervasive over time was that we were starting to see homes where the floor to area ratios were one roughly, um, which is when your house floor area is as big as your lot. Um, most cities have a setting of 0.5 FAR, which would result in needing twice as big of a lot as you have floor area. Um, we do not, we have not ever had that in our rules. So adding some setback controls to our rules that relate to floor area was a real advantage. And we've actually seen a very different product um, in the planning phase for projects be pushed out. We have not yet seen anything built following this um, standard, aside from some new single family homes on vacant lots. Um, but the development community has quickly adapted to this. There really hasn't, from my angle, been any major hiccups. Um, and it's, it's actually seemingly pretty logical and works pretty well with the development community. They understand what we're trying to achieve here. Okay, should I hold on? Okay. Um, some examples are uh, just lot sizes related to homes. So you can see the large greater than 4,000 square foot, the, the medium size 2,500 to 4,000 and the less than 2,500 square foot. And you can see the difference in lot size due to setback um, and the floor area. Um, and you can also see the difference, um, basically if, if someone is proposing a product that's a smaller home, you don't need as big of a lot. And our hope here was that with subdivisions, um, we would start to see sort of a mixed bag of homes being built. Instead of all the homes looking the same, um, we would start to see because of geometry that builders are building bigger and smaller homes, which might result in some, some diversity in housing choice for our citizens and um, might add some texture to the community. This is another one um, that shows uh, some of the additional um, 
allowances. Another thing that was added with phase one was um, some flexibility and incentive to build detached accessory dwelling units. And this is another item that was added during this effort that I feel has been overlooked largely in the community as a way to provide some diversity in housing and some affordable housing um, in that we have some of the most flexible detached accessory dwelling units in the region now. Um, you can put a detached accessory dwelling unit in your backyard and enjoy a five foot setback from your side yard or your rear yard, so long as the detached accessory dwelling unit is not greater than a thousand square feet in size and is not taller than 18 feet in height to the peak of the roof. Um, so what this does is it controls the height, it controls the bulk and scale of the detached accessory dwelling unit, but in many instances there is adequate space um, in the backyard of someone's yard to put one of these in. And our thinking there was that over time, we might start to see these um, build out in the community, which might provide some additional housing choices here in the city. Um, as you can see, this is just the R4, just shows the breakdown of how you might see some of the setbacks be built out, some of the lot sizes that might correspond to um, some of the, uh, the, what we did was we took products that the builders are actually building and marketing here in the city and we know the square footage of and we know the dimensions of because we have the plans on file. So in this case, we took Toll Brothers, a Sydney model home, Murray Franklin Cheswick model home, Murray Franklin Huntington model home, and we put them in the zoning districts which, with which we typically see them be built in order to understand what size lots would result and to understand how much land would be required to actually achieve the, the density. Um, we, we have not heard from builders that this is unworkable in any way so far. Um, and we've seen some products come in in pre-development review um, that actually uh, were able to use the, the setback successfully. The biggest obstacle to filing a application for subdivision currently is obtaining a concurrency certificate with the city. And that typically is what is holding back these products being built. So we have not seen many formal applications come in the door as of yet, although we've seen many in pre-application. Just another example of what it might look like in the R1. As you can see, the lot sizes in the R1 are much larger, um, the setbacks are larger, but if you think about it, the R1 zone is supposed to be one dwelling unit per acre, an acre being 43,560 square feet. Um, so a lot size of 12,536 square feet for a 4,492 square foot home is still smaller than the lot size if you just had a straight acre. Um, and, and that is largely due to the fact that we also have open space requirements in the R1. So if you were to subdivide in the R1, a portion of your property would be dedicated to open space and the balance could be then um, divided into lots. Um, we also uh, looked a little more closely at um, how corner lots might work, how driveways might work, how things might fit together. So we wanted to be sure that we knew what we were getting into. Um, these are, again, are some additional examples. I'm happy to share these with you if you want to learn more about these or have a conversation offline about this. Um, so this is a very important effort for staff because we felt over time that development community um, was able to do things that we couldn't control and we were constantly being asked by citizens, how could you approve this? But the reality is development community is driven by regulations and we can't ask them to do something that is not in our regulations. So when we would try to add something as a condition to a project, it would end up in front of the hearing examiner and the hearing examiner would tell us that because we don't have a regulation on the books, we cannot ask them to do that and would strike that from the requirements. So um, this was something that the staff, we had a lot of staff burnout because the staff were basically being put in the position of trying to influence outcomes that we couldn't influence because we didn't have the rules in place. So these were really important changes to be made. Um, and we're really looking forward to phase two. The next one was building height. Uh, we changed the method of measurement of building height from average finished grade to average existing grade. We added a facade height of 40 feet. We added 18 foot height restriction for standalone detached accessory dwelling units. 
one of the big problems that we were seeing in the community was that builders were artificially building up the grade of properties and mounding up the grade to elevate the, the building site of a new home. And that might be anywhere from you know three to eight feet of fill. And then they were building a 35 foot tall home on top of that fill um, next to a single story Rambler. Um, that was a, a pretty bad, um, character issue here in the city. So that this is one that was really important as well. Uh, we also addressed mass grading. Um, we had seen properties, and this is probably one of the ones we heard the most about, was where someone would drive by a site and they would call us and ask us how we could possibly have approved the grading that was going on on a piece of property where a builder might try to flatten a site um, you might see grading anywhere from four to eight feet right on the property line in someone's backyard, dropping down to a flat site and then filling the other side of the site anywhere from four to eight feet in order to flatten the site. Um, the, the big issue there and the reason why the builders were doing that is because they wanted to create building pads where they could invite sales and they could then offer any combination of, or, or any, any one of the model homes to fit on that site. So it's much easier to market homes because you can sell the home that someone wants on the lot that someone wants, as opposed to having to design a, a, a home that fits the site. It's a little bit of a different product. So this is one that was difficult for us. We've, we've made some changes here. We'll talk a little bit more about some ideas about how to fine tune this in phase two. The next one was fence heights. We allowed um, an, an elevated fence to eight feet to provide some um, protection, um, privacy to neighbors, but that was limited to 32 feet in length along any, any set side, side or rear setback line. Um, this is an important one because we've seen if we just had a two extra feet of fence height, we would alleviate a dispute between a developer and a neighbor because it would enable them to just build a taller fence and, and provide screening to someone's existing home. So we have seen this one used um, over a dozen times now. It's been successful. Um, it's an additional tool that we really enjoy having in the code because it helps us mediate disputes between two neighbors um, who don't agree on something and just build a little extra tall fence and move on. <laughs> we still also promote people talking to each other, which is the first method of resolving it, but that doesn't always work. The next one was parking. Um, over the years here, we had seen um, many, many projects that were built uh, without adequate parking. This is a difficult one because if you're thinking about the future, and about what forms of transportation and about what we might find valuable or important in the future. We may not think parking is valuable in the future. This is just something I've heard. Um, we're a changing urban setting. Um, if we were to get more transit here, which is a big topic here in the city, we might actually see um, a diminished need for parking, but we have to be true to what's real now. We do have a lot of complaints from neighbors about their neighbors parking on their lawn or parking in the street or blocking the fire lane. When somebody wants to have a, a football party or wants to have a birthday party or a holiday party and there's no parking on their street because they have a half street that has a fire lane on it and there's only two parking spaces in their driveway, it's a little bit problematic. So what we did was we added some requirements that one additional parking space be provided for each new lot created. Um, and we um, added some language about where that parking could be located. Um, we, we wanted to give some options to developers so that we weren't getting artificially wide streets or um, areas where there might have been some doubling up. Say, for example, the apron for a stormwater pond, maybe you could put two parking spaces there that are you know, short-term parking so that if you have a party, two people could park there, that kind of thing. Um, street frontage. Um, we, we've had many lots over time be built, homes be built that did not have street frontage. We've seen cul-de-sacs where we get clustering of trash cans on um, pickup days. Um, we have some examples where during, depending on the cycle of pickup that the neighborhood has, if you have a recycle bin, a green waste bin and a trash bin, and there are 10 homes serviced off of a, a private drive that don't have 
um, street front access and the trash truck won't go down that street. You have 30 trash cans collecting at, right at the entrance of that driveway and it completely blocks the sidewalk. It prohibits the active use of the cul-de-sac turnaround um, and it becomes a big problem. So this is an example of a need to change how we design things and we required that all new lots created through subdivision um, include 30 feet of street frontage on either a public or a private street. Initially it was a public street, but we, we changed it to include private streets. Um, and it also added flexibility by allowing them to average down to 20 so that not every lot has to have 30 feet. We have seen this successfully used in pre-applications in project designs. Um, the designers have adapted to this. I have not heard any complaints about this being unworkable since it was adopted. We also added, um, thanks to Mary Wichter, a uh, requirement that added a prohibition on work in critical areas um, without first obtaining a permit. There was some ambiguity in our code that um, didn't a lot, give us a lot of authority when somebody was doing work in a critical area and didn't have a permit. So we just simply added a requirement that you, you do, a, you, if you're gonna do work in a critical area when it's allowed, you have to have a permit. It's very helpful for staff because if we get a call and there's no permit on file and somebody's doing work in a critical area, we go shut them down. Makes it a lot easier. So moving into um, phase two, um, as part of phase one, there was discussion around um, punting some items to phase two um, because they didn't meet the parameters by which we were trying to amend the code at that time. We were looking for solutions to problems that we knew to be pervasive in the community. We were looking for solutions that didn't require rewriting larger sections of code. We were looking for solutions that were um, non-discretionary, that were objective, um, that didn't put staff in the position of interpreting our code constantly in order to make a decision on something. Um, so, when we came up with other ideas to include, there were items that might not have fit in that framework, and those items were added to the list of things to be included at a later date. Some of the items also would have required additional research, and we did not have time to complete that additional research. The reason being was that we were operating under an emergency ordinance, and we had a limited time frame by which to complete the work. So n now that we are, as part of the budget process, the city council in 2018 included um, $300,000 for the department to um, work on a phase two of the development code. Um, with that, there were some items that the city council asked us to include. They asked us to include the items for consideration that the planning commission had sent forward in their recommendation letter and they asked us to include any other items that the, uh, the city staff identified subsequent to uh, the work effort with phase one. So this first list is a list of items that the planning commission had included in the transmittal letter to the city council um, related to the phase one work. Um, we can walk through these, I can explain them if you would like. Um, Further down in the slide deck here, um, there's another slide that talks about the process and it talks about how we might categorize these different items. So um, if, you, if you want to wait till that slide, happy to do that. If you wanna just walk through these right now and get down to that slide and then have a conversation, we can do that that way. Um, there are three slides worth of uh, proposals here. So uh, keep that in mind. I think it might be good to just at least briefly Briefly, because some of these I know can be their whole whole meeting in and of themselves, but we can kind of just get everybody familiar with what we're, what kind of things are on the list that might be helpful. Sure. So the first one is related to a daylight plane restriction on building envelope. The idea here is that we do are we still are seeing buildings that have um, in their in their envelope a lot of bulk, and those buildings do still cause impacts to neighbors that might be north of the uh, the development. Um, so what this would be doing is pushing developers to think about how they orient the homes on the site when they're building. It might also cause them to think about the design of the building 
we have seen buildings change over time in that the roof pitches have become flatter and the buildings have become stouter, um, meaning that there is more cubic volume in the building than there has been historically where we had seen steeper pitches on roofs. Um, the issue here is that neighbors to the north and in the environment that we live in, um, we have a limited window of solar access in the summer, uh, or excuse me, in the winter. We have much a much better solar access in the summer. However, it's pretty limited um, for cert to certain months. But the idea being is that everyone should have um, a right to have some solar access and that a new building moving into the south of you should not block your entire solar access for you know, three quarters of the year. <laughs> so that's the first one. Um, the next one is adding a restriction on building height based on building segments. The idea here is that we have a lot of topography in the city and using a strict 35 foot building height measured from average finished grade um, doesn't necessarily um, promote buildings that are built to match the contour of the city. So this idea here comes from uh, commercial codes that I have used in the past on projects. Um, given that we are seeing larger buildings here in the city, it might be a good idea for us to consider a different way of measuring building height so that buildings are stepped down when they are on steep, steeper slopes or sloped sites so that they don't dominate the landscape. Um, that's the concept here. Um, basically, there'd be points of measurement that would follow the contour of the slope, and you might see a building roof line step down as as a slope falls away. So what that would do is is it would diminish the 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 impact of the bulk of the building um, on a steep slope. Uh, the next is adding a landscape requirement for setback areas of project sites that front arterial streets. Um, this one it basically comes from the comes from um, the idea that it, we we have these arterial streets and we're seeing buildings be built so closely to the arterial. The Highcroft project is a good example. There's no landscaping. There's no separation. You can look into people's homes when you drive by. Those homes are, <laughs> you know, just feet off the street. Um, and the idea here is that we we have bigger setbacks now. Um, and maybe as a result of that, we could also require landscaping um, for subdivisions on arterial streets. Um, just a better outcome, better product for the city. Uh, the next one is add a restriction on grading around the perimeter of a site to better blend the existing grade of an adjacent property into the finished grade of a project site and better protect trees and existing vegetation around the perimeter of the project site. Um, we, this could also be integrated into a PUD section. The idea here is that um, if you're building in a, a larger project, this would be harder to administer for a short subdivision. This would be more appropriate for a large, a, a long plat or a formal subdivision. Um, and the idea here is that if you're, if you're building into a bigger site that you should put some effort into considering how that project is blended into the surrounding community. We, we have one of the things that the community has objected to over time is the abruptness of the edge effect of a new project and how it might affect an area that is a soft transition that had historically been soft transitions. The edge might not last forever. You know, there's a temporal issue related to that where vegetation fills in, things change over time, people adapt to it. But the idea here is that it would, it would provide uh, a transition between projects. Um, the last one was to clean up amendments such as grammar and word choice. Um, and this could be done with or without migration to a unified development code, which we're gonna talk about here in the next two more slides from this slide. Are there any questions about any of these? So um, in addition to those that were recommended by the commission to be included in phase two, um, there are also some smaller scope items that have been identified that could be included. Um, one of those is adding some low impact development site design guidelines. We would like to um, try to provide some emphasis on low impact development because one of the problems that we have is that our land use rules don't really um, mesh up with our stormwater rules right now. 
So what this would be doing is adding some cross-referencing to some of the low impact development requirements that our stormwater rules require and would assist our, our partners in public works who are um, having to educate applicants regularly about the requirements for low impact development. So by having it found in two places, it would be really beneficial. Um, it would be really helpful for us in getting a better outcome and there would be less resistance on the part of applicants. Typically an applicant will go look at the land use rules and then they'll hire an engineer who will then try to find a way to fit the stormwater onto the property. Um, <clears throat> And if we had that sort of heads up in the code early on when they're looking at, you know, sketching out how a project might look, it'd be really helpful. Um, the next one um, is one that is, <laughs> is a, a significant problem here in this city. Um, and adding a requirement for early and advanced tree vigor enhancement um, for trees to be retained on sites under development permit review. This issue is that we see uh, applicants come in and identify trees to be retained. Um, those trees have a, a um, tree protection that's, drawn, that's shown around them, but oftentimes those trees are not wind firm. Those trees are already in some state of, um, I wouldn't say decline, but they're stressed in some way. And then what happens is a developer will go in and clear the site, will we'll strip out all the vegetation around them, will remove the other trees that, that, that were around them that were collectively providing resistance to wind and the ability to withstand wind storms. Um, and those trees are then exposed. Um, the, the exposure to sun causes the soils to dry out. It causes impacts to roots. Um, and the idea here is that if somebody's coming in for a development permit, typically a plat or a short plat, this, I don't know how this would apply to a single family home, we could work on that, um, that they're required to start doing um, tree vigor work to build up the vascular capacity of a tree to improve its health in anticipation that there will be impact to the tree during the clearing and building phase. And the idea here is that we would really like to give trees a fighting chance of survival when they are being identified for retention. Um, this is a concept that we had talked about as staff over in Bellevue for many years and we, we put together some draft code language and this is one that we feel as staff would really help uh, projects be more successful in pertaining trees. Oftentimes a project will go through development and you will see an applicant come in and say, oh, we couldn't retain all the trees. We had to remove two of the ones we promised we would save. What do you do? You know, they're hazardous. They have a hazardous tree form. Um, it's, it's a loophole in our system right now. And we're working on ways to buttress that up and close that gap. But this right here, we feel if it was executed properly, would provide awareness to applicants, would help trees live through that that experience of having development go in around them. The next was to add flexibility for new school development. Um, this one is really important um, given the fact that our uh, school districts are having a hard time finding sites within the city where they could build school facilities. Um, that's what I've heard from them. Um, we know that um, when we were at the tail end of phase one, we had the school districts come in and ask us for some changes to the building height measurement restrictions, the grading restrictions that were in favor of schools. Um, we also have had countywide planning policies amended um, in October of 2019. And there are um, principles of, um, or I guess they were called best practices that cities and counties can implement to facilitate the construction of new schools and keep up with the rate of demand or need for new school construction. So what we would be doing is trying to roll those into our code. Um, it has to do with allowing for taller schools, but, but requiring um, that there be proportional increases in setbacks when you go above the height limit. Uh, we heard from the school districts that, you know, building a five-story five school 
is not outside of the question right now and that they, they would like to consider that because they need to be able to fit the size of a school they need to fit on a site that's smaller than they used to be, have access to in the past. So we'll bring that one back to you um, if you'd like for consideration. Um, it's also, I could also send out the countywide planning policy update from October of 2019 that included the 10 best practices for school siting that cities and counties should be implementing in their codes. It's an interesting read. Um, the, the next one is refinement of technically feasible deviations added with phase one. Um, what happened here was when this got, when the phase one got in front of the council, there was more engagement from master builders um, and from the school districts and some of the, the rules that we had included regarding grading or building heights um, were uh, modified to include um, what I call uh, relief valves or off ramps from the code when something was technically infeasible. So if you were trying to build your school or build your subdivision stormwater or sewer pipe that relied on gravity and the grading restriction was prohibiting you from doing that and it was technically infeasible to do so. If you were to provide an engineering report outlining that and if the city had a third party engineer review it and, and confirm it, that um, you could then deviate from that grading restriction. Um, there are not a lot of parameters put on that. Uh, we'd like to explore adding some additional parameters to that so that it, it's more uh, binary, um, non-discretionary and objective as opposed to being somewhat subjective because this is the type of thing that staff gets put in a very difficult position over in making a administrative decision to allow something to proceed and then somebody asks us why we did it at a later date. The next one is addressing application of rules adopted in phase one to new single family residences on existing lots versus subdivisions. Um, the question here for the commission is whether we should spend some time exploring how we can uh, create a slightly different rule set for those homes that are proposed to be built on existing lots in the city versus those homes being built on new created lots through subdivision. Um, if you have had a lot that was created, say, in, through a subdivision in 1960, your family has owned it, the lot has been vacant, um, and now your family is deciding to build a home on it, should you be subjected to the same rules that a new subdivision is subjected to, being that your lot might be in an existing built out neighborhood, and should you be allowed to match the pattern in your neighborhood? That, that's one of the questions that we've been presented with by many of the single family home builders and homeowners in the city, and it's worth just considering. Um, this is one that could be kind of difficult to write, but once it's in place might really facilitate the staff doing their job and, and trying to get outcomes that match neighborhoods. This next slide is a list of larger scope items um, that are more complex and more costly and require more time. Um, the first one is one that, that we think is, is sort of medium in its um, scope, and that is the addition of a plan unit development section. Um, what this would be is something that could incentivize alternative housing, it could incentivize um, environmental sustainability or low impact development. It could also be a tool by which you allowed for clustering of development in the middle of a larger development project. So say you were building a 30 lot subdivision um, and you wanted to, um, or, or the code promoted you providing additional setback around the perimeter of the property or matching the pattern around the perimeter and then clustering at a much higher density in the middle. The comment that we got was that the community didn't was not so concerned about those individuals that chose to buy into a community of higher density or a neighborhood of higher density, a subdivision of higher density. They were more concerned about the impacts that a, a seemingly higher density subdivision had when it was shoehorned into the corner of the lot and affected the existing adjacent neighbors. So what the PUD code would be is a method of getting a better outcome from the builder and it would, it would incentivize clustering to the middle of a lot on a lot that was big enough when you're using things like landscaping or um, character assessments, um, some diversity in the layout of the lots, those types of things. There are many examples of plan unit developments or plan unit development codes out there. 
Um, I, I've processed many of these in my career as a, as a planner. Um, they, they typically work pretty well. This type of thing might include neighborhood meetings. Um, it might include a public hearing um, that would help to really work with the community to get the right product. But it would also incentivize the developer to do so by possibly allowing density increases. Maybe they get a 10, 15% density increase if they follow the PUD process and implement the PUD criteria and requirements. That's typically how PUDs are implemented is through incentives. Um, the next one uh, would be migration to a unified development code. Um, this one is a fairly big lift in the city, although um, as I think uh, you'll hear soon, there's a letter supporting it. It's something that when I came on board here in November of 2015, I was startled by the structure of our codes and the, um, the number of places that you had to go to find an answer. And if the city staff are having to go through that big of an effort using a code that we use daily, I can only imagine what an applicant has to go through to try and find an answer. Um, one of the number one things that I spent time doing uh, when I first came on board was answering phone calls from applicants and citizens who could not figure the code out. Um, I do know that my staff still do that, although I'm not fielding development calls at this point. I still get calls and I refer them back to my staff. So it is a large time sink on the part of staff is just explaining our code. Um, the next one is, uh, this is a, this could be a larger scope item. It's also could be a medium scope item, but it's included here too. It's the same one. Um, adding architectural design standards to address key character objectives. Uh, we see this as a, a fairly big lift uh, because there tends to be uh, not a lot of agreement around what character we want. When you start to talk about character, it's kind of hard, it's harder to define residential character. This is something that communities spend a lot of time and money on when they do neighborhood sub area planning, where they try to identify different generations of neighborhoods and areas in the city they put in place certain vision statements for those areas, and then they start to implement certain design standards for those neighborhoods. We, we don't have uh, anything on our books around uh, neighborhood planning in the city currently. Uh, this would be a, a fairly major change in departure. You could choose as a, a, a different option of this to try to add some architectural design um, standards that are really minimal, just to start to direct homes to look a certain way here, although those tend to be more difficult for staff to implement. And we end up in lots of arguments with architects. <laughs> um, the next one is, we see is a fairly heavy lift depending on how it was implemented because this, this the statement in itself is somewhat um, open-ended, adding elements related to environmental sustainability. Um, so if we were to go down the path of adding elements to related to environmental sustainability, we would really wanna know what our objective was. <laughs> what elements are we trying to add? Is it related to stormwater? Is it related to energy efficiency? Um, is it related to um, habitat? What elements are we talking about? We, we often hear environmental sustainability used as a buzzword. And I, I wonder when I hear that word, which of, which of the elements are they talking about? So if we could put bookends on those, that would help us. That would make it something that is more tangible and in front of us and we could actually probably achieve. The next one is similar to environmental sustainability. It's adding elements related to housing affordability. This is a very large topic. Um, it is very complicated. Um, and the question, you know, there's fundamental questions that need to be answered here about what role the city should be playing in, 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 a, in housing affordability. Um, we have made some changes we feel that will help housing diversity. Housing affordability often uh, goes along with market. So unless you're incentivizing developers to build um, homes that will then be put into a, a program for managing affordability, 80% AMI, other, other standards that could be applied to it, um, then this one is more difficult to achieve. We see the, the best method of achieving this outside of incentivizing a certain um, income bracket 
is by simply striving to provide more diversity in our housing choices here in the city so that we're not getting one type of product built in the city that attracts one type of buyer. Um, so we've tried to do that with some of the changes that I outlined in phase one, um, but possibly there's more for us to do. I'm, I'm curious what the commission's thoughts are on this and then if you have any ideas about this. Um, the last one um, is also complicated because there are only so many incentives you can add um, before uh, you've given away too much and you don't get the outcome you want anymore. So you, for example, if you allow for density increases for an applicant to do certain things in their project, well then the flip side is you're getting a density increase and you're, you're, you're likely to get complaints about the density increase. So you, know, you, you oftentimes will um, cancel out the benefit of getting a better outcome by, by offering the incentives. So this is a slippery slope and you need to be careful um, how far down this path you go because the incentives themselves can be problematic. So, David, can I ask, um, do you think that it's a reasonable, and this will probably be part of the discussion, it would be reasonable with some of these larger topics to say that we think it's important, but we will somehow bracket the scope of what we do um, and I don't know what that might look like, but you know, when you talk about sustainability, you're right, that could become a huge topic. But if we said we're not gonna allow it to become a huge topic that overtakes the rest of the items on the list, but we are gonna address, you know, and limit it to one thing or two things or something like that, or is that just likely not to be possible to, to accomplish because of there's, it's too large a scale and there's no way to limit um, in a way that meaningfully picks out something and does anything? I think if we can identify some core objectives in environmental sustainability and bracket it, that this is the opportunity to try to add those. Um, I do think that it is problematic and you could open Pandora's box, so to speak, because once, you know, it's the theory of a policy window. You have to be careful how wide to open the window because all sorts of things will be tossed into that window. Um, so if we can strategically open the window and close it and then commit as a group to sticking to what we agreed to um, and take comment on what we agreed to, but if comment comes in regarding expanding the scope, that we resist the temptation to expand the scope, then we can be successful. Um, I think that um, we have the, the time and the funds to do this. There are some things that we could probably come to cl closure on pretty quickly um, that should be included. Um, this is also something, for example, sustainability and affordability um, are, are also um, intertwined into other work products and efforts the city is, is working on, such as the urban forest management plan implementation strategies, um, such as the, 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 the coming comp plan rewrite, such as the city's efforts with the um, Regional Coalition for Housing. Um, there are things that we are working on. So one thing we could do is we could look for ways to add value to the existing projects the city already has um, that we're working on. We could meet with ARCH and ask for recommendations from ARCH as to things we could include in our code. We could look to the urban forest management plan for ways to add things related to sustainability. We could look to the past effort that was shelved regarding environmental sustainability and look to the recommendations that were made from that plan that we do have on file and look to see what we could include related to housing development that would be good to add at this point bring those back and then use, use those bracketed scope um, statements to use as touchstones as we go through the process and remember that we can't expand the scope as a result of comment that might come in that might um, tempt us to veer outside of that, that scope. Yeah, when you talk about a list of things that are maybe too large to completely accomplish in this effort, um, then I think it's important for us to think about is doing something better than doing nothing, right? Even if it's not idealized or perfect, 
is doing something on one of these topics because the smaller ones we can probably accomplish mm -hmm. but if the time limits and the budget limits mean we can't you know accomplish the whole list which makes sense then how do we choose to do something in some areas rather than just bypassing it and waiting it for some, for some other effort so I, I think that's an important consideration when we think about what to, what to suggest thank you so that we have a budget that was earmarked in our, we, we have funds in our budget that were earmarked for this process um, that were supposed to be expended in 2019. They were carried forward into 2020. Uh, we were not able to get to it in 2019 for various factors. We had a lot in our work plan. Um, your schedule was fairly busy. The mere fact that we didn't complete phase one until May of, of 2019 in itself was a problem. Um, so uh, those funds are still available um, because they were carried forward. Um, we're also in the, in the carry forward process right now for 2019, 2020. So we're, we're hopeful to um, have those available. We, we confidently know that the council wants to work on this. so. They will be available. We'll make sure that happens. There's a process that goes into that. Um, ideally, this would wrap up in 2020, or, or, or primarily um, the work would occur in 2020 with wrap up in 2021. Um, and uh, I think, again, that depends on the scope. One idea for the scope, so so before we, we get into the conversation, there's there are three fundamentally different categories here. A unified development code, that process basically takes the existing code that we have, takes it apart, all the different codes that we have, takes them apart, parks the concepts, doesn't change the settings of the concepts, and what it does is it reassembles them in a streamlined <laughs> manner in one condensed code. Many cities have been through this, it's much easier to use, um, but that's very different in a project than trying to change the code for an outcome. That is an effort to change the code for its usability um, from, from all parties, so that's very different. The other one is adding a PUD chapter. Um, that in itself is pretty easy. You, you just create a PUD chapter that might have some um, references out to other sections in the code, but it's contained and compact and could happen on its own. It's pretty easy to write. Uh, we have good examples of that for templates. The third category is, is really a little more complex because we, there's a lot of conversation around what is the outcome you're trying to achieve and how do we set the tools up in our code in a manner that we think will achieve that outcome while still not taking someone's property right away. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a balance that has to occur. Um, so that is primarily the bulk of the work that we see here. Um, we've talked about this internally. I know we talked about it in the, in the chair, vice chair prep meeting for this meeting. One of the things you could do, and I'll let you talk about this as, as an option is, is that you could go through the process of updating the code that we have today with many of these items that are here, if you think they're they're worthwhile pursuing, and then we could uh, we could do ultimately do a phase two B. Once we have all those changes put into place, we could then bring a different consultant on board, who is a code writer and attorney, um, and what they would do is they would take our codes that we have after they've been updated for outcomes, and they would then package them into a unified development code. And then that would be our code going forward. Um, and we'd have made the changes from phase one. We'd have made the changes from phase two for outcomes. Um, and then we would have then had the opportunity to go through and scrub all of it, look for errors, look for inconsistencies. Because even if we're as diligent as we can be, the way our code is set up, we're likely to create an inconsistency or two or 10. Um, it just happens just because of the way our code is set up. So that later phase 2B would be an opportunity to double check the work that we did and then also repackage it. So just let's, let's uh, just 
be clear for the commission, what you're asking for right now is our to discuss and then suggest what we think uh, the outline of the plan for what we should try to accomplish in phase two as a recommendation of the council should be, right? And that's what we're attempting to accomplish here is to develop kind of the outline of what we're gonna recommend. That's correct. I have a agenda package that I'm putting together, which is due tomorrow morning for the city council for the March 3rd meeting. So I'll be here bright and early at 4.30 in the morning writing an agenda package that has to get published tomorrow. <laughs> so anything that we add here from this meeting, I will turn around and that's why I have this extra microphone here so I can go back and listen to the tape and, and make sure I've got things correctly. Um, we'll add to that package so that can be forwarded on to the council for their consideration and then we will uh, proceed from there. So no pressure. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the one thing I was going to say that it, that had struck me, and we talked about this a bit earlier, was that the, that along with the kind of the buckets that you described there at the end, um, there is to some extent um, a difference in the work that staff have to do versus the time, I'll say, and the work that the commission has to do. So some of those topics will require a lot of discussion amongst us but like developing, the, converting the code to a unified development code, uh, we, we have little or nothing to do with that other than see the outcome. So I think that's important for us to consider, um, you know, not only what the staff can accomplish, but what can we accomplish um, once the council says, yeah, do this, do this, don't do this. We have to be able to get something done as well. So um, any comments? Uh, I'll start out and be brief. I only have, I think I do a lot offline uh, for what it's worth, but one that came to my mind that I hope this is helpful. I believe under the uh, tree vigor enhancements that the state of Washington's codes and regulations, WCRs, RCWs, whatever they are, have been very specific and upgraded uh, on construction around trees and no longer can you put up a orange plastic fence. It has to be a very uh, structural construction fence of some type to avoid the trucks backing in those. They can't be as flimsy as they were. And I believe that's in place. So hopefully uh, some of the things in the tree vigor enhancements are already in place and can be added in here. You had said this earlier, and I don't remember if you said it this evening, but one of the things that could be part of that program is um, the requirement during that time period, one year, to fertilize in a way that makes the trees healthier, which is a, to me, I thought that was a aha, mm -hmm. good example of what the program's intended to do is improve the health through the kinds of things that, you know, make sense to improve the health of the tree. So get give it uh, vitamins or whatever it is that you gotta do to make it sturdier and stronger for when it does experience that construction. And the second one, and then I'll pass it on, is architectural designs and sustainability. Uh, okay. See if I can summarize this. I think it was about 2009, uh, the city went through a whole sustainability uh, input from uh, the public, et cetera, et cetera. And nothing has been, well, let's see, not too much has been done with that. That's available someplace. And architectural design, right now, I believe character, vision, and sense of place are park somewhere in May for the city council or us to come back with. And I see a difficulty in my mind until you get something done with the city character vision and sense of place, uh, it's going to be hard to go to architectural design. But I do see something that just came to me uh, and we're talking about these incentives there is architectural design and sustainability together. Uh, one thing came was solar panels. Uh, you know, and I'm just saying this uh, out there. 
some cities actually require uh, new construction have some type of solar panel on there. So that's uh, I don't even need an answer. Just <laughs> so so what? Just one thing to remember here. Um, in response to that, that's a, those are great comments, is that the city council passed a resolution signing on to the King County Climates Collaborative K4C, what's the, what are the four C's? <laughs> There's four C's. Um, and uh, as part of that, there are um, things that we are committing to um, attempt to accomplish when the time is right for us, if the time is ever right for us. So we could, we could as a, for staff, walk through that and find what what overlaps here with this effort and possibly add some some code changes to help promote that. One of the things I know that we are talking about is adding electric car charging stations to new homes um, or making them forward compatible, potentially adding forward compatibility for solar panels so that if somebody wanted to add solar panels to their home that it's easier to integrate them into the, the structure, integrate them into the electrical panel, all those things. So those are things that we could do here. Um, requiring that they actually put the panels in, that's another topic. Um, you could promote that if you wanted to. Um, that's one that I know we would get pushback from the building community on. Thanks. Can I, let's see if Josh has any questions or comments. Josh, if you can hear us, if you get anything. I do. Um, I like the idea of a unified development code, um, and I think we could have some of the best ideas held within our code, but if it's hard to decipher, then mistakes you know, will be made, and um, I think difficult to read code is especially hard on um, the little guys. But I, what I want to understand is would it make more sense from the staff side to go to a UDC first and then plugging in our changes uh, after the fact, or would it make more sense to make changes uh, to the current code, then go to a UDC. We could go either way with that. Um, we think that, I mean, the, where our conversation went was that the UDC effort, as I said earlier, provides um, that opportunity to check our work. Um, that, you know, as we go through this effort to add new tools, it, it's kind of like the patching work that we had done um, previously. So if we created a UDC and then we went in and changed it, we'd run the risk again of not properly checking our work. Hopefully the code would be simplified enough that it, we wouldn't have that problem. So that, that's, that's there too. But um, we would prefer to first make the changes to the existing code um, and then migrate it over to a UDC. But we could be told to do it otherwise and wouldn't object either. I would just um, also offer the thought that those two things, if not done simultaneously, could easily be a year apart. And so if we're attempting to try to make changes to the development code that we all want, it may be better to try to get those changes done first because then they'd be implemented in, in developments that would happen a year earlier. I mean, I just I sort of feel like the priority might be to try to make some changes that we would see actually happen in the field. And if we did the try to do a unified development code first, I worry that that could push, you know, it, it could push it out a year before those things would happen, which would of course be instead of four years from now, six years from now, or something like that. Further, the knowing that we're coming on a budget year, um, depending on what's available funding-wise, you know, if if we were to do the UDC and then we didn't complete the changes that we wanted for the outcomes. Um, you know, we'd be left without having had those changes made and our budget could get taken away because of budget challenges the city is facing. Yeah. Josh, did you have uh, other, other things, other questions or comments? Just one more, as there's a lot of good items that you've presented to us as options, but one thing I'm not entirely clear on is, I, well, I don't think that we could have all of these done within the budget available in the time frame specified. So is there a way that we could, you know, know that uh, this, this, and this, I, these items are t will take X amount of time and you can pick these three and then nothing else is, we'll really have time or money for. Um, how does, how does that play into the decision process here? 
So we could um, complete the, <laughs> it's risky saying this, we, we, we could complete the changes that are identified on the first two slides, definitely within the scope and time frame. It is some of the other items that are less known, um, architectural design standards, environmental sustainability, housing affordability, incentives, PUD, unified development code, um, that are bigger lifts um, that might end up uh, expanding the scope to something where we'd be challenged in getting it all done. I do feel confident that the first two slides um, are something we could work on. I don't know for certain that all of these items would be carried forward. We might do some research on them and come back and say, we don't recommend working on this any further. We already have a tool in place that roughly provides the outcome we'd prefer to make improvements to that tool instead of doing something different. Um, so things like a daylight plane restriction, you know, there might already be rules in the code, such as the new setbacks or such as building height restrictions. It may not be make sense to add building segment restrictions because you know for a smaller building it just doesn't work. There are there are things to consider. We will do research on all of these if they are um, brought forward, um, and then we'll come back to the commission after we've had a chance to work on them um, and walk through the concepts and how they might work, and then we would go into code writing. So I don't see the first two slides as something that is um, out of reason to achieve. Anything else, Josh? That's it, thank you very much. Thank you. Ritujo. Um So David, I think um, I would potentially favor, you know, um, for us to at least start or proceed with the Unified Development Code because I think that is really important for our city, especially as we are maturing. Um, is there a way to do it iteratively as we do development code and then also start doing the UDC changes and then um, sort of align ourselves with that? And, and can you share your experience when you were at Shoreline uh, on how that was approached? So it, it was approached holistically there. I know that Bellevue prior to my arrival had also gone through a similar rewrite of its code and it was approached holistically. I don't know that we as staff could manage doing it simultaneously. Um, we just don't have the staff capacity to handle two big projects at the same time while we have multiple other projects going on. Um, it, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna be also tasked, I have a feeling this year with some significant work on our town center um, which is going to consume a, a large portion of our staff body that um, we, we, you know, so, so just so you're aware, we recently had to let go of two limited term employees um, due to some budget constraints. Um, one of the downsides of letting go the city manager um, and having a, a severance with the city manager was that um, a large portion of the city manager's wages and any agreement settlements comes out of our department's budget. So when we got hit with a you know $100,000 deduction from our budget that was not anticipated, it definitely impacted our ability to get work done. Um, so we had to let go two limited term employees as a result of that. Um, those two limited term employees, one of them was Dennis who was doing work for you here. Um, so we, we also have had to go through and reconcile our budget to make sure that we've, we've buttressed it up and we understand where all the costs and expenditures are, are, are going. Um, so we're left with a reduced workforce already this year. So we're really skeptical around trying to take on or worried about taking on too much and not being able to provide uh, the level of attention and detail to everything that we do that we'd like to, to be successful. Thank you. Can I go on with my questions? Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, as you know, when you've presented all the different three different options, I think, um, and and also revising our code, you've mentioned that there are different parts of our code or different codes that all need to come under. So, can you uh, maybe right now or later on provide us a list with all what those different codes are? Because I'm not sure all of us are aware of all the different. Sure, just uh, just off the top of my head, um, t starts in Title 16 
which is our, our construction codes, it's where our clear and grade code is. Um, it then goes down to Title 19A, which is our subdivision code. Um, from there, it goes down to Title 20, which is our uh, process and procedures code. From there, it goes to Title 21A, which is our development code. From there, it goes to Title 21B, which is our town center code, which is not gonna be part of this work. That's a separate <laughs> item. <laughs> um, and then uh, from there, it goes to, I wanna say Title 24, um, which is our, our um, financial guarantees um, code. I think that's what it is. And then there's Title 25, which is our shoreline code. Um, so all of those rules together make up the bodies of rules that we look to um, when we are working on reviewing permits. Um, and the rules are often duplicated in different sections, but they haven't been updated to different generational updates made to the code. There's dead ends in the code. There's references that are out of date. So it's, it's challenging. And this is all part of the Sumamis Municipal Code, correct? That's correct. So how does it work with the different plans that we have, like, you know, the shoreline master plan and, and the, like, the stormwater? How does that work with yeah, the so, code? So the, the city, um, if you think about the way things flow here, it, it all starts with the city's vision, vision statement. The vision statement then is broken down into framework goals and objectives that the city is trying to achieve. Those are then broken down into actual policies that are designed to um, influence how we might go about doing business, things we might do, decisions we might make on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, those policies are, in theory, supposed to um, be um, promoted and used in all of our decision-making. Um, and they're supposed to be designed in a way that um, can withstand, to some degree, political shift that occurs. They're supposed to keep the city on a, a, a constant course of direction. Um, oftentimes, though, you see political changes that will occur where one political body adopted policies and another political body doesn't agree, so you change the policies, which is, I think, a conversation the council's having right now. Should we change policies in our town center, for example? Then from there, you start to see plans that are, that are more specific, like the shoreline plan, um, like our town center plan, um, any sub area plans that we might wanna have, which we don't have um, beyond town center. Um, those would be included subordinate to the comp plan. And then what happens from there is those all flow down into codes and the codes are really what the staff is looking at on a day-to-day -day basis when they're reviewing permits or reviewing development proposals. Um, oftentimes we have some gray areas or ambiguities in our codes where we really don't know which way to go and we're put in the position of making a um, discretionary decision on something um, that is subjective. And what we do um, and what I've been trained to do is to go back to the policy. And in theory, you should be able to overcome a gray area or an area of ambiguity in code by reading the plan, by reading the policy, and then trying to influence what you're doing there based on what you understand the city to be attempting to achieve. Um, so that's roughly how it all lays out. Um, there are unique codes within that set, like the shoreline rules, which are not really our rules, they're the state's rules. Just they've given us the opportunity to write our rules on their, on their behalf. They own them, um, but we implement them. So it, it, there's all these different dynamics at play. Um, there's also the State Environmental Policy Act, there's the Growth Management Act, there's a the Local Project Review Act. All those things influence those different chapters and provide direction or requirements for how those chapters and things are built within our codes. Great, thank you. And so most of the, the the titles and the chapters that you referenced before, which are specific to community development, did we inherit most of them from King County and how much did we change since we, since the, in the past 20 years, how much of that has changed? So we inherited the bulk of it from King County. Um, there, as, as was stated in the memo, there have been uh, required changes made, like shoreline rules updates, critical areas rules updates, um, stormwater updates, which had some changes to the code also. Um, and then there were other, there were other um, programs that required changes to the code. 
There are also um, voluntary patches that we have made where we've been reactive to something in the community and we've decided to go and change one discrete section of the code. Those are the most problematic changes for us because oftentimes when those changes were made, there are other uh, tentacles of that section out in other chapters of the code that were not subsequently changed. So we come across things where there are conflicts as a result of those patches that were made. Um, that is really, really what we're trying to fix with this unified development code is having the ability to go through and reconcile um, years of patchwork um, and to create a, a new code made of whole cloth as opposed to a patchwork quilt. Um, and so you also mentioned the, uh, you know, uh, hearing examiner and, and when our cases go or, uh, you know, uh, they're in front of the hearing examiner, they're ma mainly side with either the homeowner or developer. Do we have a list of all those uh, uh, all those decisions and maybe, you know, can we sort of collate them into different buckets or is that something that got represented in, in, in the three slides that we have? It is something that's represented. Um, so <laughs> there's there's a variety of issues that the hearing examiner has cited over the years. One of the ones that uh, was one of um, examiner Galt's favorites was the fact that we had these um, interim um, public works standards that had been in place since the city incorporated and were only just updated in I think 2016. Um, and that, you know, there were, there were there were some open loopholes within those that developers knew about and were using. Um, those were all fixed with the updated version. Um, there is the lack of a transportation master plan that is something that the examiner has cited regularly when we've tried to ask for what would be a logical dedication of street area for a future connection, but we don't have a plan in place, so we can't ask for it. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're unable to um, really look to the future and try and make meaningful connections in our community. Um, so we consequently have lots of roads to nowhere. Um, we, we see that there are um, sections of our code, like the wetland management area section, which is more of a critical areas related issue that we might not wanna take up with this because we're on the doorstep of taking up the critical areas rules again here shortly under state mandate. Um, but there are things in the critical areas rules, such as the Lancaster Big Rock project that made review of that really complex for the staff because we have these different rules that relate to older plans like the, the um, Lake Sammamish non-point basin pollution plan. Um, there's these different overlays that used to exist in King County that are pulled into our code, um, all sorts of things. I, we have a long rolling list that we keep internally um, for things that we've seen um, over the years. So that does guide your where you want to update the code or where we see we're deficient or where we have gaps, yeah. so that does we, guide you. We had a much bigger list, but the list was lost during the, the um, ransomware attack. Oh, really? So um, we've had to um, pull, pull that back together. And I, I asked the staff that they keep a, a spreadsheet. I don't know the degree to which they've been doing this recently, but when they come across something to write it down in a spreadsheet, um, I'm not there micromanaging them on a day-to-day -day basis, so the degree to which they do it, you know, I, I know where there are a few in the code, um, so. Great. Um, one question about the school um, school buildings. So do the school districts have to follow a different kind of um, template for how their schools need to be, like how large their, you know, playgrounds need to be, and, and does that conflict with what we might potentially be doing in our code here? So we have a good case study. We have the new Issaquah School District Elementary School that is proposed um, right next to uh, Klahani, yes. Larry's residence. Yes. Um, and that uh, project yeah. has um, been pretty successful with them, their ability to design, a pro design the school. They are, are taking, you know, are asking for some deviations, you know, in, in grading in order to account for some of the landings of the entranceways um, in order to grade the property outright to get people from the parking areas into the landing of the school for the entrance of the school.
to make the buildings sit properly on the site. They've had to ask for some leeway in the restriction on grading. Um, but there are other things that we've heard from Lake Washington just recently is that, you know, there just aren't any sites big enough to build schools on. Um, I'm sitting on the uh, Lake Washington Facilities Advisory Committee, which is primarily constitute, primarily consisted of uh, consists of residents from Redmond and Kirkland and and um, Sammamish. Um, and so I've been hearing a lot from parents about some of the problems in the schools that we have up here and primarily in Redmond um, and the capacity issues. And the schools have indicated that it's really challenging for them to find sites um, in, in, you know, in, in the different cities because the cities aren't helpful or they own property out, outside of the urban growth boundary um, and, and the state law doesn't let them build outside of their urban growth boundary. You know, there's these things. So they've identified that they wanna go up and if they could do a smaller footprint um, and be allowed to build a taller school that they could therefore afford to buy property because property is so expensive, they could then build the schools that they need within the budget that they have. They could find the sites that they need because those properties are available. So there, you know, the question here is, is there a way for us to uh, allow for a taller school to occur without creating a separate zone? Um, and do we need to increase the level of process? Should it be a conditional use permit, for example? Which is not unreasonable if you're thinking about, you know, wanting the community to be engaged, wanting to look at unique site characteristics, those kind of things. So, uh, my last question. Sorry, where do you see, or do you see, um, a design board uh, being part of, um, part of at least addressing some of the issues that have been brought up that we want to address, like a. Uh, not architectural, but you know, a design board. I think it has come up in the past and based on your experience, have you seen that happen successfully in different cities and what challenges do you see with that? I have not worked in a city where there is a design review board, so I can't speak to what it's like to work on the staffing side of it. Um, I know <laughs> just through the, my, co my cohort basically of, of uh, counterparts in other cities and friends that have worked with them that um, they can be very successful if they're staffed and filled with appointees properly. Um, character, if you're after character, is one of the most difficult things to define and implement. I, I recall, you know, working on a PUD in Bellevue called Kimberly Park Two, and um, it's right off I ninety, um, and it uh, it went to the hearing examiner because the hearing was required as a P part of a PUD, and one of the criteria was that it conforms to the character of the surrounding community, and it was appealed on that point because the question was, well, what is the character of the surrounding community? Um, hearing examiner ruled that it conformed and it wasn't a problem because residential is residential. <laughs> that's what the hearing, that was it. Residential is residential, that's character. It went to court um, and the court, I can't remember how the court ruled on it, but it was, a, it was a big deal. And the court had something to say about the fact that the neighborhood didn't even have its own character sorted out because all the homes were built in different generations. They all looked differently. So how is you, how can you as an adjacent neighborhood, Kimberly Park One, um, even raise an issue on character when you don't even know what the character of your own neighborhood is? Um, so these are the kind of things that, that would be at play if we start to try to implement architectural standards to drive character we really have to have a handle on what that character is that we're trying to achieve. Um, and it's not easy to put a handle on because everybody has a different perspective on what character is. Um, hence all the different design, home designs you see in the community. Thank you and thank you chair for indulging me. In my professional life, I've had the opportunity to um, deal with quite a few design review boards and I would absolutely concur that it sometimes works and oftentimes doesn't. <laughs> Good to know. And I can tell you a lot of stories if you're interested. <laughs> How about we go down to the end there, Karthik? 
quick question. Um, where does the um, water management come into? I know that we have said um, the environmental sustainability is sort of optional, but we've seen in the last 15 days, there was a lot of runoffs and creeks overflowing, and many of the residents were concerned that these were the effect of the new construction and lack of code around how to manage the runoffs and so on and so forth. Where does that come in with respect to this um, rewrite of the code or relook of the code or kind of thinking through this, um, you know, what a city of Sammamish's code is? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so the Com Department of Community Development has very little oversight over stormwater rules in the city. Those are under the purview of the Public Works Department. Um, the city's stormwater rules uh, really stem from um, the city's obligation to abide by the Clean Water Act. Um, under the Clean Water Act, it's passed down to the state um, to implement, and the state passes it down to local jurisdictions to implement. We have what's called the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Permit, where we are allowed to discharge a certain amount of, um, we'll call it turbidity, sediment, other toxics into waters of the state and waters of the US. Um, and we are um, held to task on that. We can be fined if we exceed that. Um, so this city's public works department has a, 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 a stormwater program um, by which it um, is required to manage the city's surface waters. Um, there are multiple layers to that. Uh, Department of Community Development typically does not get involved in um, stormwater systems on properties because that is something that civil engineers deal with in the, in the Public Works Department and the Development Review Division. One of the ideas that we'd raised here was adding some parallel um, partner code language to the development codes that we, we have to help work collectively with our public works counterparts on what you're talking about. So if there are ways for us to add, um, whether it's under environmental sustainability, whether it's under low impact development, um, ways to help get a better outcome so that we don't see as much sheet flow or um, spikes in hydro period related to rain events, um, that that would be really helpful. Some examples of low impact development are um, providing for additional tree retention, if you can achieve it, um, requiring soil amendments to improve permeability, um, requiring um, that stormwater is handled on site through um, stormwater features, such as level spreaders, um, vegetated flow paths, um, there are alternative methods to designing home foundations that don't interrupt um, what I would call, I think it's, it was groundwater flow, but I think it's a hyperreic function of landscape, which is where water flows subsurface laterally. And when you modify the soil pad, you end up with a disrupted um, flow, subsurface flow. So stuff comes out, you see seeps increasing in certain areas and it's, it's difficult to manage water in that way. Um, I do know that the, the city's uh, stormwater rules are some of the most restrictive in the region. Um, and one of the ways to best describe that without spending too much time because I could go down this path for quite a while um, and I really don't wanna bore you to death with it is that when a city is tasked with designing a national pollution discharge elimination system um, code, a permit, they have to get a permit, we have to have codes and programs in place a city has a spectrum of choices it can choose from. Um, on the one hand, a city can spend a lot of money retrofitting its own systems to deal with sins of the past. Where one of the things that's required through that whole program is to make a net improvement on stormwater systems as opposed to where you were in the past. So a city could choose to spend a lot of taxpayer dollars to retrofit systems um, in order to account for fixing problems, allowing for new development to occur, regional stormwater approach, that kind of thing. Um, but that's a big expense. 
On the other side of the spectrum, a city could choose to do very little in investing um, in its stormwater, um, and it could put all of the onus or the responsibility on the new development that's coming in to not only account for its own stormwater, but to some degree fix some of the problems of the past. And that is the range of spectrum of what you can do. Most cities tend to land somewhere in the middle where they're making a fairly robust investment in stormwater infrastructure. They also have a fairly restrictive code. Where you set that spec the meter, the, what do you call it, the notch, whatever you want to call it, um, on that spectrum, really is dependent on the city's desire to facilitate development. You can facilitate development by helping build public infrastructure to promote development in certain districts, different areas, different basins, if you will. Um, what, what ends up happening, and what's happened probably in Sammamish, from my observation, is, is that we've tended over here on making less public investment in stormwater infrastructure um, to fix problems of the past, and we have opted to implement a code that is very restrictive with regard to stormwater rules Generally speaking, Mary might disagree with me on some of that, but generally speaking, um, with the idea that um, we can start to fix some of the problems. And you, you'll see projects in you know, the Beaver Lake um, Basin, the Pine Lake Basin, um, where we go around and around with developers who claim that they just can't build it. We have people who are building vaults that they claim for a new single family home cost them $100,000 to build. Um, we are seeing um, sites where there are bigger and bigger tracks being put in place for stormwater management. These are all new projects, um, but you have to also think about the fact that, um, and, and I think a really important point that you should always consider in the community, and the more we can get information out on this in the community, the better is, is that development, specifically subdivision, is given a very high level of protection under state law, not something that we can change. So typically a subdivision will have a shelf life of anywhere from seven to 12 years, maybe more, depending on the cycles in which it was reviewed. So what happens is, is that say you came in in the year of 2003 and you applied for a subdivision proposal and you had a complete application. At that point in time, your proposal was taken a snapshot of rules that applied with it, right? So you, you are vested or grandfathered to those rules that were in place. It might take two years to get through the review of the subdivision before the preliminary subdivision was approved. From that point, so now you're at say 2005, from that point, it could even take three to five years, you just never know. Um, so from that point forward, um, you then have uh, five years to build the improvements. Um, so now you're at 2010. Once the improvements are built and the final plat is recorded and the lots are created, then you have, depending on when it was recorded, up to seven years to actually build the homes. And those homes are still being built according to the codes that were in place way back in 2003. So I think one of the biggest misunderstandings in this community is how that works. Because we hear constantly, I thought we changed that rule. How can they still do this? I can't believe it. The city staff are letting them do this. How come the staff are doing this? State law lets them do it. We have no say over it. Um, and really trying to change that message out in the community is really important because we as staff get beat up by, by citizens over that regularly. It's kind of unfair because we can't do anything about it. But that is part of what we're trying to do here is do something about it. Exactly. <laughs> but but these are though interrelated, right? I mean, when you when we approve a development, it does you know, and and when you decrease the vegetation, we sort of increase the um, runoffs from from the development, right? That's correct. Um, so 
So it's our code that actually uh, controls the development, but our code uh, doesn't control runoffs. That doesn't add to, you know, in my mind, right? I mean, we are causing um, a change in status quo, but then we are not, res the code is not responsible for managing the change in status quo. Is that what I'm understanding here? Yeah, and one, one of the problems that we have, so you, you've, you, you've identified a problem that we have, um, and it's sequencing in design. So what happens when a builder comes in to design something is, is they look to our land use controls, our development controls, or zoning, you know, setbacks, building heights, open space requirements, road requirements, and they try and figure out how to fit their product in. Then what they do is they try to figure out a way to make our stormwater rules work, right? Um, so r the good designers that we see know that that is a problematic approach and they will do both at the same time because they know they have to fit the stormwater systems and features and vegetation retention, all the things that go along with it on the project site. Um, so what we would be doing is trying to front load that mindset and change the cultural practice around how builders design things in an effort to get awareness that, raise awareness that you need to account for the existing features on a property, the impacts that that will cause. Um, the, the, the flip side to that is, is that um, people have, you know, I, I don't know how best to frame this, people have property rights. And we're, we're constantly in the give and take of taking too much versus them, you know, getting too much. So how do you fine tune and balance out someone's right to use and enjoy their property um, versus getting the right outcome for the community, not degrading um, natural systems? It, it's, it's challenging. Thank you. Mark? In respect to your early morning um, work <laughs> schedule, I'm gonna be kind of brief, just make a couple comments. I think it, the UDC transition is a must, um, but it appears from what you've said, it might be wise to take the large recommended items um, that we've been discussing tonight and get those in first and then do the UDC and then worry about the other stuff later. Uh, don't want to bite off more than we can chew kind of thing. Um, but I, I also thought that the school issues were interesting and that they need the flexibility to be able to grow um, with the number of schools we have in a reasonable manner. So I would support that too. Um, and then uh, I just really appreciate all the information you've given us tonight, it's extraordinary. Um, but I think, I, think, I think we can clearly say that the UDC is, is a, gonna be a priority. It's just how that fits into the process. Thanks, Thank you. David. Go ahead, Mike. All right, uh, actually a number of my questions have been asked, so yeah, try to be brief too. I do have a couple. Um, of the list, and I'm thinking especially related to environmental sustainability or affordability, are there any state, county requirements that we may be at risk of if we don't address those? Not requirements. Um, I would say that anything we can do to promote um, living up to what we promised with our letter of commitments um, for K4C, and there are some things I think that we could include here that are pretty simple. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to achieve, to, to set a carbon emissions um, limit here. That's not our objective. Um, but we can look at um, some other ideas around energy efficiency for homes. Um, we can look at water conservation. Um, for homes, there are there are general environmental sustainability things that we can do, um, so that would be great. We're not going to be at risk of if we don't do anything, of being out of compliance or conformance with a state or county mandate. Um, with regard to housing affordability, um, 
we we are about status quo in the region for um, what we're doing. Um, so we're not really at risk for being out of compliance with housing affordability. Uh, I would always argue there's more we can do <laughs> just given what I know about um, affordability in the region. I think we all know it um, when we pay our mortgage payments. <laughs> um, but well, we're just, not just looking at the list that you have and trying to like, where do we call the list, so to speak? Um, you mentioned a little bit about, I'd call it the cost of not having the UDC with all of the codes and the questions that staff has and so forth. Um, I'm interested in understanding if that also relates to some legal costs because of the complexity and that, which would argue maybe for moving the UDC up in priority or in sequence versus keeping it later. Yeah, there's there's that side to it, definitely. Um, just the sheer cost of providing what we call project guidance to applicants at the front counter um, in itself is, you know, we probably spend, it's hard, I, I don't live in this daily anymore, so it's hard for me to, but I knowing what I know, we might spend 40% of staff time just doing public information related to project guidance, which is non-recoverable fee time non-fee recoverable time. Okay. Yeah. So I don't, I, since we're running late on, I, what I'll, I'll make kind of like, here's my thinking about this, that there are things here that really impact what the feel of the community is. Um, the landscape requirements, for example, and they're on your kind of easier list. So as you start to think through this and figure out the cost and so forth and what really can get done, uh, you know, obviously doing some of those easy, easy things early, like you were saying. Um, I think the school would have a lot of impact on people. You know, you hear a lot about class sizes and teachers are really stressed and strained. Um, and getting those done and then um, in sequence having the UDC added uh, while leaving out some of those larger scope, tougher things unless there's some regulations or something that would drive us to do that in a in a kind of a more limited way might might make sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have a few comments. And if this goes for very long, I'm sure Larry will uh, take care of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, starting out with the UDC, I will kind of reiterate something I said maybe to you, David, earlier. I struggle to see how that is a strictly a, uh, it doesn't fit with this work plan to me, it feels sort of like a non-commission topic because there's really little or nothing for us to do other than get it in the end and look at it. The other thing I just caution is as I thought through that, if you try to do those two things at the same time, one of the things that's useful is to be able to kind of do things very incrementally so when you change code, you can do a red line version and see exactly what changed and understand what's happening. If you try to take apart and reorganize the code while you're also trying to make changes, it'd be much more difficult for those of us who are part-time, certainly, to track through the changes that we're making. And those consultants that are doing the work might understand it very well. I'm not convinced we would necessarily be able to grasp it as well. I think that would be a big challenge. So I almost feel like saying, although this is a bit of a cop-out, the UDC is kind of back to you as to how does it happen? When does it happen? We all think it's a good idea. You think it's a good idea. Everybody thinks it's a good idea, but I'm not sure that we can tell you when to do it and to not do other things because it's it's so little touch from us. It's purely about staff budget and, and time. Um, I would take it off the list only because I don't know that it should be on our list necessarily. These other things are different to me in that there are opportunity to just what you said, Mike, influence the the housing product that gets created in the community. And if that's the if that's our objective, that starts to narrow down some of these things. Uh, I think that that could be helpful because then, you know, while it might be great to require houses to be wired for electric cars and solar panels, I think that's a good idea. I'm not sure that that fits into the topic of making the housing product that the community experiences better. The people who buy those houses, it would be better for them probably, but then, then they could pay for it if they want to. The market will certainly drive that if it's an important priority. So that's why I think if we set the, the struggle I've had with this is how do you start to narrow it down into something that we could accomplish in a reasonable period of time? And if you say, 
the test, the litmus test for each topic is, is this something that creates the potential to improve the housing stock in the community in a way that the community is looking to see it improved? That's a good litmus test. Those are things we can work on. Um, just a little bit further to that, I'd add a couple things. One is having experienced some of those uh, ones that came from the commission last time, I kind of think that uh, I would, for my two cents, take the daylight plane off and keep the segment, the housing, the building segment item there. I think they're kind of overlapping into the same thing. And one of them probably works better and the other one doesn't work as well from what I recall the discussion. So we could start to narrow some of those down just by saying these two things are kind of the same thing. Let's, you know, let's figure out how to make it, pick something and do something. Um, the schools, I think, that is a probably a bigger topic than what we're expecting. Um, it, it's, I think it's a little bit more complicated. Not to say that we shouldn't address it, but I think we should have the right expectation about the potential for, for that discussion because there's, you know, there's a lot of different entities, the city, the school districts, all of us who have experience with the schools, parents, teachers, it, it's a bigger topic than it seems. Um, I think that probably looking at this list, there's no bad ideas, but the incentives and the affordability, I'm not sure if we do most everything else that we would get to those two. They're kind of at the bottom of the list. They're not bad ideas, but I'm just, I'm hesitant that those two topics we would get to, um, or we would have to choose that and sacrifice other things on the list. And I, I you know, again, affordability is a super big important topic in the community. Um, does it pass the litmus test of creating better housing product through changes in the code? Mm -hmm. Maybe, right? It's just that, so if I, if I was forced to choose, I would probably take those off the list because I think that we have plenty to bite off in what's left above that line. Um, so if we have a little bit more discussion, is that enough guidance or do you need something more specific than that from the commission? So I, I really <laughs> like- When you ask a messy question, sometimes you get a messy answer. <laughs> um, well, you know, scoping a project is messy inherently, so this is a, <laughs> this is a great discussion. Um, uh, I will say that these types of changes here and here are really high value add for the staff. You know, we really enjoyed phase one as staff because we we want to change the code to get a better outcome. It's something where we struggle, we can't do our jobs effectively because we don't have the tools. I feel like these two slides, the first two slides include items that um, are really important and are tangible with reason. There's some of them that float to the more to the bottom of more complicated like the schools. Um, and I, I like the idea um, around, you know, so generally scoping the litmus test first will help us identify what would fall out. So if we could get simple, even simply just guidance and you know, you all can talk about whether you support that statement, now Mark, or Ch you know, Chair Boffman made a good um, statement, I think, to, to start that conversation, or, you know, maybe, maybe you all like it how it was stated, that generally we're looking at code changes that will improve the outcome of the housing being built here in the city to, in a manner that is more in line with what we think the community is expecting of builders in Sammamish. Can you roll to the next slide? Um, so what we could do is we could start, and what, what I could do is I could start by taking those items on these three slides that I know to be consistent with that, and I also know to be simplest, and start with the simple ones, and I could put them in a progressive order for the council, saying these were all the items that were brought to the commission, if you have any to add, let me know. Um, you have until I think nine o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, and and then uh, what I would do is I'd present that to um, the council and say, here is the the objective. These are the different items that could be included in trying to achieve that objective, listed from 
you know, the simplest to achieve, lowest, highest value, lowest cost, down to the more complicated, it's possible that the UDC is a separate project. Um, not to say it is not equally as valuable. Um, I just don't know, given the staffing that we have and the work plan that we have, if we can handle both of those in a really tight back-to-back -back manner. And I really cannot honestly respond as to whether which one is better to go first. I just, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I see it both ways. I do know that the UDC is something that we get a lot of value out of as staff, but it's not as rewarding for us to work on. <laughs> um, these first two slides and the third slide even are things that we as staff find a lot of value in working on and we get, um, you know, in, in a policy wonk sort of way, really excited about. So um, we're, we would we would probably veer towards making these changes first just because they're exciting to get moving on and to show the community that we are really serious about trying to change our rules. That's probably why we would opt to take those first as opposed to the UDC. So looking at my lit litmus paper, the chair's pretty green and so is the director's, but time is yellow. <laughs> so I move that we extend tonight's meeting until um, 8.45. Second. It's been moved and seconded to extend 8.45. All those in favor, aye. I oppose no, thank you. We're extended 845. Um, yeah, I'm curious what others think about how to, you know, in the in the context of these are, there's nothing on here that's necessarily a bad idea, but of all the good ideas, we have to choose what we prioritize. And, and you know, I, I think that there are other ways to evaluate some of these too, such as, you know, the plan unit development, if our, if we do work on the transitions topics like grading or if those things are in place and we're seeing them work, that might address some of that topic already. So even though it's a good one, maybe it's not as important because of other things we have in place. I, I think, you know, I'm curious if others have other ideas about how to pick and choose or how to prioritize things mm -hmm. in a way that you can draw a line. Well, I found, I, you know, I'm new here, so I don't have some of the history. Um, I read through what was sent before. I felt that the presentation was a real step up because it started to put it into like this is like, you know, easier scope, this is harder scope. Um, having been a consultant, I do everything in two by two matrices. <laughs> and, and to have something, if it was possible, to say this is difficult and here's impact to the community, right? And so. Uh, that might help, a that would have helped me to get that sense of impact. Like, you know, daylight plane restriction, is there a big need for that or not? I don't know, you know, maybe picturing that would, would be helpful. And the other part that I struggled with kind of being new was I think what you were just saying about, you know, some of these things do overlap and which ones, if we did A and B, did we get most of C or D or one of the others? Uh, to help make those those decisions. Now I know you've got till nine, so <laughs> I don't expect that. But if as you discuss it with council, maybe that would be something to start to think about as well. And I absolutely would move the UDC as a separate category. It, it just at that when when I was going through it, it felt different. I, you know, how does this fit in terms of impact to people? So my two cents. Thank you. Um. I would say um, my preference would be to sort of um, have items that we, uh, and, and very specific items that we can get complete, complete those items in this year or, you know, whenever we have that timeline. I think we had great success with phase one because we had specific items we could focus on and actually complete um, our, our review or, you know, the, the uh, code around. So um, my preference is definitely on the first two slides, you know, which have shorter items. I think um, probably I would need feedback from 
the staff on what is it that you're facing more most often um, in your work and what would you need clarification on? Uh, I mean, you know, you said schools, sure, schools do need, you know, guideline, but we just have one school. We don't have any other property in our school and our city limits where they're potentially thinking about building a school, even though I know like Washington has some property um, close by. So uh, maybe that might help you as well. Um, and, and you know, um, and then even same thing for subdivisions. You know, how many applications are we getting, or have they all dried up? You know, is it mainly for single-family homes that we're getting? So, I think we probably would. I would look to guidance from you again to say what your priority would be, or what are your pain points that we can um, proceed with. Thank you, Josh. If you're still there, do you have anything? Any comments? Um, I do. I, I agree that the UDC should be pulled out and maybe separate. I'm going to trust, uh, David, your judgment on which one should go first. I definitely understand getting some of the other high-impact items uh, done because I think it's important that the community sees action being taken there. I think the first two slides, that, like you mentioned, um, should be included and maybe the larger scope ones excluded. The only one I'm thinking might be good to include would be uh, elements around environmental sustainability, but not things like green housing initiatives, but more like um, things that go to community character, um, but not like, you know, adding charging stations into, you know, garages. Um, and those are my thoughts. The one other thing I was thinking as well that we should do is not necessarily um, lose some of these topics because, you know, let's be optimistic for a second and say, what if we get through some of the other stuff more quickly and we have a little bit of capacity to take on something else? We shouldn't lose the list and say, oh, we're going to stop, you know, if we if we can, then we could, you know, maybe, maybe have a discussion about um, affordability that's bracketed by you know what the what the development regulations say or something like that uh, I, I think it's just important not to necessarily cross things off the list permanently but to say here's what we're going to accomplish and that's our plan and we're sticking to our plan but if things go better than we're planning we still have the opportunity to do other things that's a little again squishy but <laughs> but i do think that in, inevitably if things are moving along people will want to talk about some of the other items that are on the list and i think that's probably appropriate one of the ways we could do that is we could actually have, if we're working with a consultant, have them brainstorm some concepts around how we would implement some of those items, housing affordability, incentives, um, and come up with some preliminary concepts so that should we find the time or opportunity to work on them, that we're that much farther along. So I will also, being uh, by a little bipolar in my mind here say that being pessimistic for a second we've talked talked about many of those topics already and they're big and difficult to get through so experience is appropriately conservative in saying we may not accomplish that but they're important i think to people sitting here and to the community so we shouldn't just you know discount them out of hand but i think i i do like the way you're kind of talking about prioritizing that way to review that with the council and get their feedback about what's appropriate and whether they agree with where that line kind of gets drawn and that defines the work plan. I think that um, should be helpful for everybody. Just one thing that I recalled out of the con past conversations um, that should be brought to the surface here is that planning and development code section was really important to master builders. Um, they felt like they were giving a lot in negotiating with us um, in some of the code changes that were made in the last, in phase one. Um, and what they were looking for was opportunity to get back some of that flexibility that they had enjoyed for many years up here um, by adding a PUD section where if they promised to do a better product and work with an landscape architect, do all the things we asked them to do, that they could, um, you know, get some um, benefit and incentive out of that and get some flexibility in design. Um, so that one I know was really important to them. So I just wanna make sure to raise that here. It, it is a little more complicated, but that was one of the original concepts that 
sort of stuck around in the conversations and even followed um, in subsequent conversations with the council um, after we even had adopted the, the phase one code changes. Yeah, the one thought I did have about that is that, um, and you can certainly stop me if this is incorrect, I'm envisioning that that really only applies to long plat or large sub subdivisions. And given the current state of the concurrency test, I'm not sure how many of those are gonna be approved to proceed, even if we made these changes. Just from a priority and timing standpoint, it feels like this is a good idea for the future, <laughs> that maybe it won't be practical anytime in the, in the upcoming near term. That's my kind of gut reaction or assessment of that. I, I mean, I like the concept, and I think you could almost do a light version of it if we if we get to it. I'm not sure that it'll be very applicable anytime for the next f foreseeable time period. We also are um, going to have available very soon the um, conclusion of phase two A of the buildable lands land capacity analysis where we'll be able to identify clusters of lots that might be developable or redevelopable, and we'll have an understanding of how many bigger projects we might potentially see if developers were able to achieve assemblages of lots. Um, and that will also be somewhat revealing as to regard as to whether or not this is really a, you know, a urgent issue to work on, because maybe there are not that many of those clusters left in the city. I just don't know. Okay, anyone else have comments or questions? Have we done enough to get you so that you could sleep through the night and then dive in in the morning? <laughs> you have, I believe there's one more step. We have to take public comment. Yes. Okay, thanks David. I, so, I, I have what I need and I really appreciate the conversation and the feedback. Um, this is a, you know, it's challenging to try and change the outcome and you know, you're know you're right here in the moment doing it, so. I will say that, um, I, especially hearing your feedback, one of the most rewarding things that I feel like we have accomplished in the last couple of years on the commission were some of those changes, um, particularly because that's may, in many respects the reason that some of us are here. And then to hear that it actually is having an inf influence is very rewarding. So thanks for the feedback. And I hope that that'll you know get you guys excited about doing this phase two as well. Okay. I, I meant nine-ish when I said. Is that okay? All right, let's uh, let's do uh, public comment. Does anyone have any public comment on this particular topic? Hi, my name is Mary Wichter, and I live at 408 208 8th Avenue Northeast in Sammamish. First of all, absolutely great materials, excellent presentation, fantastic information. Um, former and new commissioners, you have really, really excellent questions, um, thoughts, and um, I think the discussions that you've had are very good. Um, based on particularly what David said about starting in 2003 and still building in 2017, I think you need to focus on there are some things that aren't regulated that need to be, like right now, you don't have to have any setbacks from steep slopes or slopes or they're not even identified. Some of the landslide code still says up to an acre. Well, that should have been removed in 2016 when we did the stormwater code, but it's still in the development code. Those are areas that I live in. There's a lot of lots in those and they're impacted. So I really think small things need to be put in the scope. They need to be done first, maybe even separate, but we can't not do those because we can't wait another five or 10 years. The errors have been there for a while. I also think when you go through those, you see how you might be able to change the code later with the UDC and you'll see how it interacts better and just briefly on stormwater. Stormwater is in Title 13. It does have low impact development, which is required to be used 100% at first. Nobody ever used the code before because the incentives weren't high enough. It's required now, and I don't think the current code actually allows you or wants you to leave your native soils and all the stuff you need to do, and the local, the low impact development that is in this city isn't working. I know 
city council has gone and seen those. So there definitely is something that needs to go on there. Just like the trees that we're saving, I drove by two on my way and it's like the trees are dying. The house is one big house on one acre and the trees are dying. So there's just stuff that isn't happening there. And that's not urban forestry management plan. That's actually development code needs to change to do that. So I think um, the other thing is, is you're not going to have a lot of big subdivisions with all the traffic and currency. So what's building right now is the individual houses. Subdivision does have a lot of protection and code, but there are places in the code where it applies to short plats and subdivisions, but not existing vacant lots. Between Tamarack and uh, Inglewood, we have 90 vacant lots that people are building on steep slopes because... Um, East Lake Sammamish Parkway is exempt. So I think you really have to focus on what are those things in the code that you can do that channelizes it, that makes it, some of it's critical areas, some of it's not, but you have stormwater code, clearing and grading code, development code, um, shoreline and some of the others. So I think those really have to be looked at and I think that's the number one thing to do. And I also wanted to thank you for bringing up the low impact development because I had actually forgotten about that until you put it on. Um, I think it's really important to have the setbacks um, prohibitions, I think the clear and grade prohibition actually takes away some of your exemptions. Like I think public utilities and road work in a critical area even needs to clear and grade permits. So I think those need to get looked at a little bit. Um, it's, these are changes, not just grammar and word choice. These are functional changes that really do need to get addressed. Um, and like I said, single family homes independently on individual lots are just as important. And also the when you have somebody grading next to somebody, I think that's super important because I do see where there are five, six, eight feet difference and it's just not a good idea, particularly one is slope because you do get the water that runs through. When I saw David's slides tonight, um, Director Pyle, um, the first thing I thought was, there'll be a phase three that's needed. <laughs> um, and whether you put the UDC in that or not, um, I actually am a computer scientist. I've done a lot of coding in my life and I would say doing the changes and fixes is probably easier than rewriting the whole thing, but knowing that you're gonna do that and need to do that is very important. I also support the Gina Clark letter from Master Builders and also what Mark Cross um, had that we handed out earlier. So I think that those are very important. Um, I think uh, sustainability for the environment, anything we can do to make the environment better, like I agree the daylight plane thing is a little bit odd. I know Mercer Island looked at doing that and took it out, but I believe where you have the, I forget what it's called, where the different levels of housing, you need to do that like in the area I live in, you kind of have to build that way. I think that is an important thing to put in. So I think your first two slides are set up very well to do things with. I don't think you're gonna get a lot of, money other than the 300,000 you already have to do more. So I think that's gonna really limit what your choices are because if you do put it off, you're, you may not get time or money to do it later. Um, I do think schools, if there's anything we're doing to prevent schools from building um, or not be able to build in the way they do, I think we have to take those limitations off. I do know, do know Carson Elementary was built so that it could go up because they did it without state matching funds because they were gonna have to close schools in Kirkland if they made it two story. So there's already schools existing that might need to be modified as our um, population goes up. Um, but I think the trees, I think the grading, I think fixing anything that you can to make the houses better. I was around with when Frank Blau, and thank you for reminding me, I was here in 2014, not 2015. They gave the character thing to Planning Commission and it got bantered back and forth between council and stuff and it, because there wasn't enough hooks to really define what that was, that didn't go anywhere. And I think the architectural design would be headed the same way. Um, so I think with what you guys have talked about, I think the questions that you've had are really good. I think David has a very short time to work on this, so it'll move forward to council. But I think having the phase, I think phase one was very successful and this stuff is already getting used. Phase two I think is utterly important to try to do everything meaningful that we can. I think the f bigger stuff like the UDC has to be a phase two B or a phase three. And then I think the bigger things, I, I just don't think it's gonna be possible to get to with what's on the work plan and I think what Whatever happens with town center and the decisions for that, it'll kind of impact what's happening in this phase too anyway. So it uh, won't take my whole time to give Paul a little bit of time to speak, but thank you for all the work that you're doing. What you're doing is very important. It will change our communities and what happens in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Paul Stickney, 22626 
Northeast Inglewood Hill Road. And uh, I'd like to say that the comments Mary made were great. And I concur with how she started out with all the accolades for everything that happened this evening. Don't have to uh, repeat that. It's a good job. Um, I'm starting to talk to community members and city council with a topic that will underarch your development regulations and cover a whole lot more. Very briefly, the city vision statement for the community calls to meet housing affordability through optimized, balanced, and sustainable housing. Commissioner Crandall mentioned this evening three very important pillars of the community, character, vision, and sense of place. That's another large topic, as is our community vision. Circle back to what started at the meeting, uh, you know, um, we heard about what would our community do if we could redo our housing over? That's an interesting uh, question, and that is one of the things that I have been asking in my meetings. And the transportation master plan, another heavy lift. However, this is maybe counterintuitive, but I didn't know this. Talked to some city staff members over the last couple months, and uh, if our community decides not to grow, there's no need to do a transportation uh, master plan. It's based on the future. So right now there's a lot of discussion in the community about what is the future growth outcome. And if we, if we uh, uh, do grow, then we need to manage that to manage our, you know, TMP. So in my opinion, there are two significant, call it, you know, oh, let's see, what's a good word for it? Um, large groups of information or basically, you know, body of information we need to have to manage all these things. Our community vision, character, what would we like to be in TMP? And they are really short. What are the housing needs and wants of all members of our community relative to our housing supplies? Where are we short and where are we long to what people need over a cycle of life? What some people call a seven generation planning perspective, which is to think long term. And second, what is the build out the capacity for additional single family homes in our city. We need these two things to get all those other things right. In my humble opinion, after getting that information, we need to add more smaller, different, and you know, diverse houses in our city and add less large single family homes. And here's the bottom line. Optimizing housing economics and transportation will have affirmative effects on everything, including the you know development regulations that you've been talking about this evening. I call this enrich and sustain for Sammamish. Now, I'm all done except for three interesting little side pieces. K4C. And I had to look this up, I will admit, I did not have it off the top of, of my mind, is King County Cities Climate Collaboration. So that's what all the C's are. But, but they call for four cool things. They call for cleaner vehicles, which is coming. A lot of people are doing that. They talk for VMT reduction. In my opinion, optimize land use would very much reduce vehicle miles traveled, a K4C goal. Two things that could be a part of, of your discussions are building energy use and green infrastructure and limiting the use of uh, natural gas for heat. 
they're trying to suggest energy efficiency and using electricity. Okay, something else as a side topic. Not many people think about this, and I try to hammer it home when I can. Housing affordability is relative to 30% of income for all income levels. And in Sammamish, 80% of the households make over 100% income. And the question is, how are housing supplies relative to those needs over time? Last thing to uh, chat about is, um, is, and I did not have this off the top of my head. I went in and looked and I took notes. Uh, back a year ago, uh, you know, Todd Levitt from Murray Franklin came in with three uh, plats that they had run before the new development regulations went into place. And they calculated on those plats that in those three plats in Sammamish, they had 48 lots and the new code, and they were under the old code, but under the new code, they would have had uh, 39 lots. So about a 19% less. And in relation to, to my comment, that is in line with optimal housing supplies and city character. So that's it. Just wanted to share those things tonight. Have a good evening. Thanks for your comments, Paul. I will just point out that we also had written comments from um, from Mark Cross in support of the develop the revised um, development regulations, and then from Gina Clark from Master Builders. All right. Do we have anything else, David? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'll be, I'll drive by on my way to work tomorrow and see if your car's here early in the morning. All right, anyone have anything else? If not, I could use a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Thank you. We are adjourned.